Hello everyone, welcome to OpenShift Commons virtual meetings. Uh, we meet here every every Wednesday. I am Valentina. I work with OpenShift every every day. Um, and what is Commons is really a place when um, customers, users, partners, and contributors we meet here and discuss and also learn and share and contribute and present different topics. So for today, I have here amazing speakers. We will do a panel on what is uh, IDPs. So I have here with me Abby, Christophe, and Pietro. So um, Abby, do you, yeah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. I am the very honored guest from outside of Red Hat. Uh, my name is Abby Bangzer. I work for a company called Synpaso, where we build Cradix, which is a toolbox for building an internal developer platform. Uh, and yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of the Red Hat family of products and people. Uh, I've been at OpenShift Commons at the last couple of KubeCons and been really lucky to, to be a part of them. So very happy to be here and, and collaborate with a lot of Red Hat colleagues in the platforms working group, which is a part of the CNCF and I'm a co-lead of. So doing a lot of things sort of around around this space and, and excited to hear about different perspectives on IDPs today. Yeah, it's so great to, to have you. We met, we were talking the other day, we met at KipCon Chicago, I think it was, I don't know, like years ago. It feels like I, I met Eon. you and I know you for <laughs> a lifetime already. So it's such a pleasure to have you here. Um, we know that you know a lot about platform and IDP. So hearing your perspective, it will be very interesting uh, for the audience here. Um, yeah, Christoph, do you want to go next? Yes, absolutely. So I'm Christophe Parvet. I uh, um, work at Red Hat. I'm a product manager working on the Red Hat Developer Hub. So that's an offering based on Backstage. And I'm also heavily uh, uh, not necessarily working with uh, uh, Backstage, but uh, involved with the community to, 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 to make progress on, on Backstage. Yeah, that's great. Now, I love Developer Hub as well. I've been working with Developer Hub for like a year already. Um, and that is started, uh, and we will talk more about this, like how we, uh, I was working with customers, helping them adopt really like containers and Kubernetes and how we ended up talking about uh, IDPs. Uh, Pietro, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Piotr Kieszewski. I'm working at Red Hat as well. Uh, I'm an engineering manager and my team is helping Christoph to build enterprise-grade features on top of uh, Backstage. Um, so my background is in virtualization and overall infrastructure management, but I'm really happy to help with the developer experience as well. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to have you. And where are you based? I know we are all diverse. Like I am based in New York City. Where are you based, Piotr? I'm based in Krakow, Poland. Nice. What about you, Christoph? Yeah, I'm based in Canada. In Canada. Nice. Abby? And I'm in London, despite this That's accent. So <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. Love this. So, uh, yeah, so today we want to start talking. Um, we want to talk about IDPs and we want to talk about the, the future of IDPs. But before talking about the future and how we can, um, yeah, how we see those IDPs in, in the future, in the near future and long term. So we want to start talking about really what an IDP is. So for those in the audience like I have there, um, I would love to hear about, yeah, what comments do you have? What an IDP is? Um, I don't know if Abby, do you want to go first? Yeah, what a softball to give me first. Thanks for that. Uh, of course. <laughs> all right, so I guess the first thing I would just say is IDP in itself is a, uh, uh, an acronym or a three letters that gets confused, right? So depends on how long you've been around. You can talk about it as identity providers. You can talk about it as uh, internal developer portals or internal developer platforms. The, the the last two, of course, being why we're why we're here today. Uh, whether or not you want to talk about portals or platforms as an IDP, as the definition of IDP, I think you want to be talking about both when you're thinking about how to support an organization's development practice for success and security and to move faster and and be more efficient and, and be more secure. So what, uh, so I'll maybe touch quickly on the two. So with a portal, what you're really looking at is the user experience of uh, someone being able to get access to the information they need when they need it, where they need it, and in hopefully one place. It tends to be in the conversation today, a, a browser-based option. Um, and there are both 
open and closed source options and, and lots of things, but in all of them, what they're looking to do is give you access, not just to read information, like what is, exists in my environment and, and how is it doing, how healthy is it, but also request things. So this is that self-service aspect, get what you need, don't be blocked by some other you know, internal team responding to you on a ticketing system. The thing that happens behind that user interface is, is oftentimes described as the platform. And so it pairs, this is why these two portals and platforms pair so well together. Because when building software, we look to keep logic uh, in a server that can be reused across different displays, including a portal. And with a platform, what you're looking to do is orchestrate the business context for being able to provide those self-service uh, capabilities, those things that people need access to, and making sure that they're business relevant and uh, meet your standards. So often this platform is orchestrating things like business processes with manual approvals, but also technical processes like uh, security scans and also uh, technical processes like deployments and scheduling of things in different regions based on data residency and all those kinds of things. All that sort of the brain of how to manage the complexity of your deployments often lives in that orchestrator, so. That's um, great. What, what are your thoughts? What problems are we solving with the IDPs? You were, you were saying, hey, this is it's kind of this this thing that runs on the pla on top of the platform to really give access to all this tooling. What do you think is, is the problem that we are trying to solve with the internal developer portals? I think that the portals have become exceptionally popular recently in the last year or two because it's a pushback from when the infrastructure or cloud operations or whatever you want to devops whatever we want to call those roles was exposing their solutions and their complexity to users so for the last five to ten years it'd be really common to ask a, an application developer who spends all their time in javascript and css land to when they need to make a change to something about where their application runs they'd have to go look at a helm values file or a Terraform module file, or an Ansible jobs file, or any one of many of these tools that can help in, to uh, manage that infrastructure complexity. But that's us in the infrastructure layer exposing people to things they don't need to know about. And this portal is like a breath of fresh air to users who don't want to manage all that complexity because they're given a user interface with fields, just like they have when they go online shopping or online banking. And so it just feels like they're getting that abstraction that actually will reduce their uh, cognitive load on making requests. Yeah, no, and that's... That's, that's perfect. Yeah, just summarize it really well. And Christoph, what do you think? Because we have started talking about the problems and kind of the value of the IDPs. What are your thoughts on this as well? Yeah, what have you have seen from customers? Uh, yeah, so the customers are looking to reduce the, the cognitive load from, uh, from the developers, because we, especially with the cloud, um, uh, we just mentioned like infrastructure, but security or automation, they, they, um, they, they have to learn lots of different tools and technologies that keeps uh, changing. Um, uh, even to just move something to the, to the cloud, you have to learn uh, like about containers. So it's really uh, the, the, the developers have to always learn new technologies or migrate their, their application. And they are spending uh, all their time doing this instead of delivering business uh, value. So just what they do best when we talk about developers is just to, to implement new features or uh, maintaining their, their app. So, uh, so the uh, one big point of uh, having an IDP is just to accelerate uh, this. And uh, one of the uh, use case would be to use the, the self-service. So that would be a place where the, uh, we'll focus on the developers, but it's not limited to only developers. We can have different personas. Uh, they will be able to provision some infrastructure, a database or a cache or a Kafka, and they will uh, have like their pipeline, uh, even the code generated. Um, so uh, for example, the enterprise architecture uh, team would be able to provide uh, anything, uh, like some of the best practices or recommendation so when a developer gets started, everything is already uh, out of the box in seconds or minutes, and they are just ready to, to build APIs or a UI, but they, they know that everything is uh, is ready for, for production. So they, this, they will save weeks uh, weeks of work. Um, uh, even someone will know all that, they will have to go to another uh, repository, probably a fork it, uh, update, and um, do webhooks, whatever, like all the pipelines. So even for someone that is senior, they don't want to, uh, to do necessarily that, and uh, they will save lots of time. And yeah. I would just add an extra point uh, that Abby already mentioned, but it's, uh, it's kind of agnostic. So we don't replace the, the, the tools uh, uh, 
an, an existing organization can use an IDP and that would just sit on top of their existing tools. So this is very important. We don't force anyone to change their, their toolings or their processes. You just abstract. So if uh, a developer or someone would like to know more, they can deep dive on, the, on, the, on those tools, see the configuration, learn about the, the YAML, but if they don't have the time or they, uh, they, they don't have that knowledge, uh, they, they don't have to care. They just build their code, do a commit, and that just gets uh, deployed to production. So it's really providing that flexibility to enable developers then to focus on what they should, which is building the apps rather than, you know, all the processes. Like when I started, so I was a developer a long time ago, and I remember that, you know, long, long, long time ago, we started focusing on the programming languages, right? Um, and then we started working on different architectures like the web, right? And then we started focusing on frameworks, you know, uh, a lot of different frameworks that were focusing on patterns to, you know, uh, to resolve common patterns so we can uh, just enable the software capabilities more easily and quicker. But then you needed to learn about all those frameworks and how to use them. And then we started adding more things and complexity, as you were saying, like the cloud. And then now we have containers and then CICD and then it is becoming, yeah, a lot for a developer. So I really like like the way that I think the industry is going, like how we can enable the people who are really adding the the value to the to the user. I mean, everyone is working together, but they are like I feel like the the last gate, right? When they are the ones producing the source code, and to do it more quickly so they can produce faster and quality as well. Because we also care about security and we will talk about that uh, in a second. So Pietro, what are your thoughts as well on the, within the value? On what are the things that you have seen? And maybe you can talk us about what are you working on right now as well? So um, for me, the IDP value is um, with the lack of communication or lack of that um, um, knowledge that people need to have to interact with the organization when you when the, when there is like a small startup everyone knows who to ask uh, what to do and who to ask for something to happen in infrastructure when the organization is growing um they're they they become like a uh, gating um tools to access for example, IT or other parts of the organization. Uh, so you need to open tickets um, um, or just tr uh, go through the documentation and, and prepare something as, as, as needed. Uh, with the IDP, you can just come in, um, find what you need, uh, trigger that and interact with the tooling without actually having that pure knowledge. Um, and uh, what me and my team is focused on, we provide a um, tool to orchestrate existing systems. So um, one of the use cases that, uh, that is uh, really nice to think about uh, that we are solving is whenever someone is onboarded uh, to a company, um, and I've been there myself, you have like a really lengthy document, create this account, uh, get access to this system, open that ticket, that's a, everything can be automated pretty well. And people are wasting like days or weeks uh, to set up everything so they are productive. Um, and it's just waste of time. And people are frustrated because they cannot really make uh, progress, uh, contribute to the uh, to the source code developers like to write code so they would like to contribute. Um, so it's lack of efficiency at the end of the day. We can um, we are offering a way to um, to describe the the flow uh, with the, with with the workflow, and we can we can open tickets. Uh, for people, um, we can track those tickets. If tickets are not uh, not approved on uh, on time, we can escalate and send someone an email that, hey, there is a ticket waiting. Just do something about it. Someone is waiting. Um, interact with different systems um, just to make sure that that time uh, from someone joining a company to being effective is as short as possible. Um, so that's one of the uh, interesting use cases that we are trying to uh, solve for, for the users.
No, that, that is very interesting because as developers, as you said, sometimes you just need access to an MSP in the cluster, right, to start building your application. But then there is uh, a whole process sometimes that can hold you back and you need to wait like from weeks to months and just to make this happen. And from that, it's not only like, you know, holding you back to innovate, but also just wasting time and sometimes even going through different teams and, and having all those discussions and even figure out like, hey, how is how is the step like how I can request access? That could take time as well. So having that automated can really help with yeah, with the escalate that do that scale right. Um, so when talking about the personas, we we are talking about the developers. But um, Abby, what are your perspective as well? Like how I how IDPs are like collaborating, helping teams to collaborate, and what are the other personas that you see in working with with IDPs? Yeah, it's it's. Honestly, part of why IDP is a frustrating, uh, popular three-letter word right now, because there are more than just developers. There are uh, product uh, managers, there are UX designers, there are uh, managers, there are execs, there are people who have the need to be able to get access to things, customer success and service that need to be able to get access to things. They may have different needs, they may have a different onboarding workflow, but they themselves will have um, services they need access to and tickets they need opening and visibility into, to Christoph's point, like underlying systems of data and all that stuff. So I think there's a lot of personas in the um, in the kind of users of portals space. And I want to take a, a second to also talk about how there's lots of personas behind those portals as well. And, and one of the things that um, I'm a team topologies advocate as well. I, I love that straddling of technology with the CNCF and, and people in process with team topologies. And they talk about platforms and what they're really talking about is building on the shoulders of giants. Portals are building on the shoulders of giants of other systems that they're talking out to. But the people who are configuring those systems, those workflows that Piotr you're talking about that do all these complex things like checking on the status of a story, how long it's been open for, what's your trigger for escalating who to escalate to someone has to build that and they themselves are developers they may be developers who specialize in bash versus in javascript but they're still developers and so thinking about that developer experience uh, up and down the stack often generates a better experience all over the stack and i think that's where platform engineering as a discipline is early days in in sort of becoming popularized as a word and we'll see how it lands in the long term and how long that lasts but really talks about the idea of building those services getting access to think creating ways to give access to things easily reducing cognitive load of the layer above you is i think what we're talking about enabling portals who then can enable all those other users like managers and product people and and all that yeah, and that connects with the idea of the platform as a product. That is a very hot topic right now. So what are your thoughts in, in, into that? Yeah, uh, just like platforms and platform engineering, platform as a product is uh, getting a lot of people claiming to be the, the originators within the last few years, when in reality, I think it's something that people have worked with and tried at different organizations for many, many years. And really, it's one of these concepts where if you haven't come across it before, you can almost feel silly having not thought of it. But you shouldn't feel silly because everybody stumbles across things, you know, eventually and, and comes across things. But it's really just applying that mentality of customers and uh, prioritizations and thinking about the problem space before you start throwing solutions out but applying that to those internal tools as much as we do to our external tools that we sell. So platform as a product is as simple as applying the same strategies that you apply to the things you sell, but to the things that you offer internally and treat your internal teams as customers. Really. Yeah, I remember we, so we met, you know, at KubeCon some time ago on the platform engineering breakfast and we had the discussion of a survey to the end users. And yeah. that for me was a very powerful thing because really if you start thinking who are the end users and how I can gather feedback from them, either it's positive or negative or how the platform is working for them, I think it's a very interesting tool. Um, and I'm wondering, Christoph, like ha what have you heard also from, from your customers and what you have seen about you know, either surveys or performance of product or what, what are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so uh, we we have some some great customers. Some have been already building their own IDPs uh, uh, for for many years. Uh, they've been actually very successful. Obviously, they don't want to necessarily manage this because the technology changes, or the tools, or integration to other tools. It, it takes a lot, a lot of work. So uh, that, that's where Backstage is kind of coming in because there, there is a, a way to uh, to extend the platform uh, via plugins or uh, several me mechanisms. So uh, we can see that uh, the is becoming more popular and people tend to, to switch to, to, to backstage. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah, in terms of uh, services, uh, yeah, you have to, to treat it as a product. Um, it's something that is evolving uh, uh, like very, very fast. So you want to stay up to date. Uh, it's not something you just release once a year and uh, you hope that uh, it, it still works. So you really need a, a team and uh, uh, it's kind of like your, your pet, you know, you have uh, to cuddle it and uh, make sure that everything is, is okay. So maybe in the future, uh, that won't be like this, but at the moment, that's where that's where we're at. So. Yeah, and so you were talking also about the, the Red Hat product, right, that is the developer hub, which is based on Backstage. And what are your thoughts on either like security and compliance and also the two operations? What, 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 what are your thoughts on that and what you have seen so far? Yeah, so well, back, backstage is is pretty awesome, and there is a very large community. Uh, it's it's very uh, very active. Um, um, you can extend the platform or integrate with other tools uh, via uh, plugins. I think at the moment it's about 210, 220. Wow. Last time I checked a few weeks a few weeks back. So uh, you have most likely an integration with everything, and you are not limited to those integrations. You can actually build your own. So you have a custom. API system internally that nobody uh, nobody else would use in the world, but you can still create a plugin for that and add it to your uh, to your IDP. So this is great. Um, but uh, backstage is still uh, is still uh, early early tool. So uh, uh, is it's working. It's great. You can extend it. But in terms of security or things for uh, for compliance and, and regulations for for larger uh, customers that will still mi uh, miss uh, uh, some some features. So this is something that we're adding in the developer home. Uh, uh, for example, like uh, uh, like the audit log and, uh, and a few other technologies. Um, so obviously, we always uh, contribute back to the uh, to the community. But sometimes can can take a long time to, to get things approved. So uh, at least for for our customers, we have uh, we have everything uh, ready. Yeah, like the RBAC and policies. And, yes, yeah. yes. So obviously we have RBAC. Uh, earlier we we're talking about personnel, so definitively that helps uh, based on uh, who can do what. So you will see uh, different things in your in your catalog or access different templates uh, or have different views. You can have different pages that they can uh, they can access. And if you are uh, uh, if you are an executive, you can see some reports or, uh, or based on on your profile, you will see different informations. Yeah, that's great. So you have seen also executives wanted to have access to to the tool as well, to the IDPs, and how how they use it. So currently, I didn't see many um, executive using that, but I see in the future that that will be uh, open to everybody. For now, it's mostly um, developers or DevOps a bit infrastructure. Uh, I see more and more people asking questions how they could see their clusters or, or have visibility on some uh, some infrastructure. Um, and we're talking at scale. It's not just for like 10 clusters or something. It's like thousands of uh, uh, of data. So that's, uh, uh, that, that can be pretty pretty big. It's just we have to, to create the integration with the uh, with the different uh, with the different systems. It's not necessarily Red Hat creating all those plugins. That would be also with the with partners and the community. Uh, but uh, uh, as we have more integration, and then we can open to uh, to more uh, to more personas. That's uh, no, that's great. That's very interesting. And what are your thoughts uh, on the trends that customers are, are are looking into into the IDPs? Is it only like uh, for uh, you know containerized applications? What are the things that you have seen? Um, maybe AI, or what, what are the trend, the common trends that you have seen? And also interesting to see like. What? How do you see maybe the IDPs evolving, like in the next few years as well? That is a very large question. I think yeah. we, we probably have a, <laughs> everybody on the, the call has probably something to say. So I will just keep it short. Uh, I've seen uh, lots of uh, great uh, great things. Usually, onboarding is a is a big point. Or uh, for example, mag migrating an app. Uh, 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 non-cloud to, to, to the cloud, or like, uh, uh, lately it's been more VMs. So definitely those are very uh, uh, big topics for, for uh, our large customers. Um, AI is also a uh, very uh, 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 hot topic. We have lots of questions about it. I think it's still very, very, uh, very new. So um, 
usually the main use case that everybody's asking is about uh, generative AI to create configuration file or, or projects based on, on their own uh, enterprise architecture, like their, their toolings, not necessarily based on public data, because that not necessarily match what they are looking for. Um, but I think this could be open to many other uh, use cases, like helping reduce the cost of a running app uh, to the cloud, because we, uh, we have access to lots of uh, data, uh, or just generating tests for legacy apps. So that could be open to many other, other uh, use cases. So I think we're kind of feeling like in, I don't know, 98 or 95, when that was the, the beginning of the internet. That was, there is something big there, but we just don't know what's, uh, what's going to, that's going to look like. So I have the feeling with AI is well there, that that's going to be a big thing, but, but still uh, there is a long way to go. Yeah, we are in early stages, I think, of AI. Everyone's trying to figure out uh, what we can do and how. Um, Abby, what, what thoughts do you have on this? Uh, I'll, I'll echo and say that it's quite a big question, but uh, I'll see if I can add to it. Um, I think the trend I may maybe would add to, because I think Christoph covered the AI and, and all the future opportunities here really well, is that when we're talking about IDPs as portals, the honest to God truth of the trend I'm seeing today is that people are trying to figure out what the portal is going to do in the long term and what is going to be pushed elsewhere from the portal and how to package things into one interface when they have all these other interfaces that that value prop of you have everything in one place but you can always dig into the, the lower level tools you know does also mean that you're just adding another interface on top of the interfaces they already all have and and i think people are sort of trying to figure that out right now what is it that needs to be in a portal how do you provide people the things they need there give them the access to the deeper level tools when they need to in an effective way and i think that's all still honestly being being felt out uh, by lots of different people across lots of different different domains. Um, and I think that what we're hearing is with all this potential that Christoph was just saying about what can be done is making sure that that is enabled across an organization, even when you have users who operate in different ways or through different interfaces. So a portal is one interface and is particularly effective for uh, people who live in browsers a lot, right? So this might be people who do a lot of product work. It might be people who um, are engineers and, and use a lot of tools commonly. So they're kind of often that. But there's also going to be a subset of people that aren't in the browser as often. They uh, want to use the CLI tools or their IDE tools, their integrated developer uh, environment tools. And, there's, and they need to run things in CI CD tools. And so all these the power of all these things being exposed through that portal in the best way possible, as well as being actually codified in that platform to enable any interfaces that you want to enable in the future and support is, I think, going to be a, a, a huge thing that's being talked about right now. We're seeing a lot of people start at the interface and then go, uh oh, uh, and, and figure out how to take that logic back out. It's, to me, you mentioned, Christoph, the, uh, the evolution to the, the internet and how it felt like you're on the precipice of something. To me, it feels a lot like the era where people realized mobile apps were really a thing. Mm -hmm. And they all of a sudden had to take all the logic that was in their web application user interface and actually extract it into a server, an API, so that it could service you know, Android and Apple and web apps and all that. That's how I feel like we are right now, is we're trying to figure out where does logic live? Where, what, where should displays be? Which ones should we give to which users? And all that, which is a really awesome, interesting place to be. Yeah, it is. It reminds me um, that I've seen some IDPs where, you know, they started building like a small thing and then started evolving and then they started realizing like, oh, I wish I had integrated GitOps or, you know, or Helm or because right now it's so difficult to work with yes. and or maybe, you know, taking into account the UX experience, make it, you know, easier for developers to understand as well. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it, I feel like people are just jumping on it, but I, I, as every technology, you need to just start thinking like, okay, first, what is the goal? Like, why am I trying to achieve with this? Who are my personas, right? And what are the use cases I want to cover? And then start designing and make them part of the process rather than just build something and then expecting people to use it. And at the end, people are like, no, this is not, you know, good for I think for I me. hear uh, <laughs> treat it like a product. Yeah. Uh, and and, and maybe end. I'm also hearing a little bit of a treat it like software, you know, like architect it, like design not big upfront design, but kind of setting up the, 
the hooks for being able yeah. to extend, make it extensible and maintainable and all these things. So I, exactly. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, <laughs> agree that's, more. that's the idea. That's the, yeah, yeah. I come from the, you know, as I said, software development, so I can, I tend yep. to think of that, but it's, it's true. We need to think of that as a product so we can start receiving feedback. And also like, if we start thinking how this will evolve through time, right? Like yeah. it will be changing, it will be maturing. How we adapt those IDPs to, you know, the new era, as Christoph was saying, with AI. Um, and also like right now, for example, I work on, on a solution to include like virtualization, which is a hot topic right now. How we can enable those developers to, you know, work with uh, legacy systems in a more efficient way by provisioning, giving them the self-service to provision built those machines. So how far those IDPs could go, right? Uh, I think it's very interesting because if we start thinking that as, that as the single pane of glass, right, when we want those people that like, you have really like that self-service easy access, I think we start looking into creative ways to provide, you know, those end users like a, a great experience. Um, and Peter, what, do, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, it's a really broad topic and I've been listening yeah. to all of the comments and I had so many thoughts uh, throughout my uh, throughout, the, um, uh, throughout the discussion and as far as I can tell when I'm a developer by heart many people are still in the command line and uh, just moving to browser and see that really shiny UI that you may have may not be always the most efficient option. Even if we are trying to improve that developer experience, um, it's important to make sure that our IDPs are extensible. There is an API that can be automate, that can automate. And with that, you have a really nice entry to, to the world, um, to the world of, uh, IDPs and I see IDP as a marketplace. On one hand side, we have developers who are coming in to have like that single pane of glass uh, where they can see systems that are that are configured and available for in in the IDP. But on the other side, you have people who are offering those services inside of the company, and the common interface. For, for both um, is that IDP to interact. So for example, from my perspective and the plugin that um, uh, my team is working on um, the orchestration, that common language between the two parties is, is, uh, is YAML, um, which translates to, to our workflow. On one hand side, the developer can come in, um, write, uh, run those, uh, those workflows. But the implementation in on, is on the side of SREs, um, IT, uh, security, and other teams that uh, need to work with those developers. Um, uh, I think that there was a kind of interesting question about execs uh, using IDPs. Um, we implemented uh, interesting workflow from for one of the customers. Um, we call that uh, application modernization use case. Um, there, there were there are many companies that are still running their software in the VMs, but as as we know here, uh, OpenShift or Kubernetes that's the platform of the future. And now, if you have like um, a lot of applications that are still running in the VM, and you would like to actually get to those containerized environments, how to get there? Um, and uh, it's it's really challenging tasks, especially for the for the big com uh, big uh, companies, um, because you need to um, adjust the software. It's not really like you just take it, container, uh, create a Docker file, and you run it. It's not really like that. There are, usually there are architectural changes um, and and fixes. So we are uh, we decided to automate uh, a migration toolkit for applications, which provides the static analysis of the code in, in context of how far away is particular application from running in, in a container. Um, so by uh, statically analyzing that, we can, uh, we can see what is missing. We can start opening uh, Jira tickets or whatever tracking system a particular team is using um, for developers actually to start making the changes. Once they are uh, once they are ready and they did several iterations of scanning, um, they can go and uh, generate the Docker file, the uh, Kubernetes manifest, uh, build the build the container image and running it. Um, so that's that's one thing. And when where those execs are coming in, 
um, we were requested to provide metrics. So as uh, where the particular teams are with, with their migration process, how many interactions they did, how close they are to migrate their, their, their code to, uh, to containers, that's really something for execs to understand where where is the organization um, in terms of modernization, and that's a really nice value that you can provide for uh, for people who would like to understand how the company is performing. And this is one of the ga uh, the gauges here. Um, so that's something that that you can. Um... Yeah. I love that you're doing that. I don't think portals can succeed in the long term if they don't accept. The, the full breadth of things that an organization has to worry about. And I think there's, you know, uh, the trail of, of left behind technologies that have failed because they only accept certain sort of, um, that they force an organization to kind of wholesale change, right? And that that's just not gonna be realistic for enterprises of certain sizes and, and legacies and, and duration. So I think that's awesome, the work you're doing there. That's great. Yeah, I love it. And also to include more personas, right? Because also the execs are also wondering, like, why this project is important? Why should we invest in modernization? Why should we invest in containers? And if we gave them, like, you know, a visualization tool that can help, you know, see the, even the, the progress of what they are doing or even metrics about the success mm -hmm. that is getting even from, I don't know, saving costs or accelerating, you know, developer uh, software process, I think it's, it's a win-win for everyone. Um, and I have seen when 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 the execs had, you know, there is a, a, a clear vision and mission of why we are doing this. And that goes to all the teams, not only creates that alignment, but also the motivation behind it. Like people feel like they are part of it and they understand like why we are doing, I don't know, Kubernetes, containerizations, IDPs, right? So having that, uh, you know, a tool where everyone kind of is welcome and there is a use case for them, I think is, is very, it's very interesting. Um, so we were talking about AI, we were talking about kind of the future, um, but also wondering like what, what have you seen in terms of, and, and this is for anyone on anti-patterns, what are the things that we think we have seen that is, it didn't work, and what are the things that we want to tell, you know, the audience that just don't do it. <laughs> um, so what are your thoughts? Maybe Abby, you want to start? Uh, I mean, I think the biggest anti pattern we've already talked about a bit, which is building logic into a user interface. Like, I mean, you heard Piotr was like, it's all about developer experience. I live in my terminal. Okay, well, if you're going to then make it so that the only way they can do something is to open up a browser, that's not going to be right for their developer experience when that's really why we're building this portal in the first place. So making sure that all that power we're, we're organizing, keeping that server side, keeping that in an API, making that something that can be called from wherever the developer's experience is best suited uh, or the, the user's experience, right? Execs in the browser, developers in the terminal, whatever. Uh, so I think that's the biggest one. Uh, as for an additional one, I think the one of the things I talk a lot about right now is that the building of a portal or a platform is about uh, the that marketplace. I, I can't remember who said it, but someone else said that today about it's a marketplace of what developers need and, and what the organization's offering. And I don't know if we spend enough time talking about the building of that two-way marketplace, right? Because my analogy here is if you are work at Etsy, you're you might be a fantastic potter or or jewelry maker or painter, but that's not why you work at Etsy. You're, you're at Etsy, you're building the platform that enables people who create things to put them out to market and enables people who want to buy creative things to buy them. So that's what the Etsy and that's what the Etsy team is doing, whatever their role is. And as a platform area, whether that be platform engineers or product people or anything, we need to focus on that uh, capability of actually engaging the the SREs you mentioned, Piotr, they're doing the workflows and the, the developers, the execs, the product managers, whoever it is that wants access to those things, building that marketplace. And, and that's where I think uh, Developer Hub that you all are, are investing so deeply into and, and building so amazingly and, and different sort of interfaces are going to be key to building that. And that's kind of that, uh, that collaboration is what we codify in something called a promise. And I think as long as you have that concept of like, creating an API where you're bringing together uh, and enabling anyone from the organization to commit in the security requirements, the performance requirements, et cetera. 
and allowing people to make requests, you're going to be in, off to a good spot, I think. No, that was, yeah, I agree. I agree 100%. Christoph, what do you think? Yeah. And, and I would love to hear about maybe what's next for, for Developer Hub, if you want to share any, any updates as well. Yeah, well, just uh, just uh, to add uh, something on to uh, uh, this point is definitively you cannot build an IDP or even use an IDP if you have silos. Uh, you really need uh, like platform engineering that brings uh, DevOps, infrastructure, security. Uh, you need really all the folks. If you do inner source in your organization, that's even better because you will probably have some SMEs on, on some topics, so you can leverage already that knowledge. Uh, so this will be like a like a great start. Uh, uh, otherwise, that's going to be very hard if people don't collaborate. Uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's unfortunately not going to to succeed. Uh, whatever the tool you are uh, you are bringing. Um, yeah, yeah for, 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 people uh, what, and processes, right? Within yeah. the tools. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, one, one, yeah just, just one one thing to to add, and I I really fully agree uh, with with Abby's uh, statement about that. But to Christoph's point, sometimes, especially the bigger organizations, they are siloed and they are pretty opinionated about the tooling. And I think that one of the um, challenges for IDPs is to see how those people can collaborate together, um, how, can interact, how they can still interact with each other and have that service consumer type of approach um, without actually breaking that those opinions and the preference towards tooling. I think that that's one of the biggest challenges. Still, um, silos may be there, and, and developers, are, those are the beasts that are the highly opinionated. Um, so I think that this is one of the challenges and opportunities for IDPs um, to, to do it right, so to improve that communication between people. Um, that's, I think, that is one of the best uh, promises that we can offer to, to developers. Yeah, and this helpful adoption, uh, that's a, a big point. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so it's the future of IDPs, like bringing people together. Uh, what, do you, what do you think? What is the future of IDPs? I don't think the main goal, even if it brings people together, or at least they, they force them to, to work together, I don't think that's going to be uh, the main goal. <laughs> I think the main goal that was more uh, going faster to market. Uh, let's say you hire a new employee, obviously they have to do some onboarding in the company, but the first uh, the first day of coding, they should be able to have a, an app uh, to production or like an environment very close to uh, to production uh, with everything that they that they need. Everything should be uh, should be available, so that that will cut the cost uh, of uh, of onboarding or uh, ready to, uh, to get to production. And same with uh, other um, uh, use cases like Peter was mentioning with uh, with the migration VMs. If we can automate this, we're talking always like it's thousands or millions of VMs or like it's or it's always at scale. So that will uh, take years uh, for uh, for a dedicated team to to migrate this, and if we can uh, do that in just in a few months or uh, or just uh, with a couple of folks, uh, it's a time saver and uh, and uh, and uh, cost uh, uh, efficient. So this is definitively something that our enterprises are uh, are looking at uh, uh, right now. Uh, the future is pretty open because we can usually extend the platform. Uh, so I would say the sky is the limit, or wh whatever people wants to do. Obviously, we should uh, keep a uh, some constraints on, 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 or like guidelines on, on some of the things we, we want to do. But uh, I think with Backstage and what we are providing with the Developer Hub, uh, we're in a good path uh, for uh, for having some, uh, like not a tool that is just good for a couple of years and then you have to, to replace it with uh, something more uh, more efficient. So, uh, I think we, we are already providing this. Um, but definitively, we'll add more personas and more use cases. So that's, uh, that's just the beginning. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, who, who wants to add something else? That faster, safer, or more efficient is is always going to be whatever the, the plan is for the business. And and Christoph, you're you're I think targeting that moving faster is a huge uh, sweet spot for a portal, which is great. Mm -hmm. I think um, when we're talking about the the future of portals, I think the things that are going to uh, enable kind of success there is that extensibility that you're talking about, Christoph, and and being able to grow into both older use cases, so bringing those VMs on that Piotr is looking at how to modernize, and, and also those newer use cases. So your organization may not yet be touching WASM or even serverless yet, but 
you know, being able to onboard those is going to be is going to be key. So uh, I think the extensibility of things within platforms is going to be um, and platforms and portals is going to be really important uh, in, as it continues to grow. That's great. Yeah. Pietro, do you have anything else you want to add? I would highlight that extensibility because people will start will work on new tools and it will be a challenge for IDPs to keep up. And with Parkstage, we have the plug plugin meca mechanisms um, that people can, can, can add that, but it needs to be flexible enough so it's easy actually to add additional tools and be able to keep that uh, efficiency in place um, as the time passes. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And I feel like uh, right now, um, of course, the focus is always, yeah, how to reduce the complexity and efficiency. And I'm wondering if we also need to start thinking about new teams who will be, you know, using IDPs. Uh, right, right now, the main focus is developers, but we are looking in, hey, what about virtuous machines? What about AI? Maybe help the data scientists and who are the next group is it the data science or is it another group of teams that they may benefit benefit from you know automation and having that single pane of glass that could really facilitate and you know bring that value closer and faster into into the market and into the business so um it is a very interesting way of seeing how teams collaborate together just to bring you know uh, success into their organizations so but yeah. I think that point you're making about the abstractions and, and and being able to go to like other roles as well, that abstraction comment I think is is one to zoom in on as well because there it's not just abstractions like someone can use a browser interface for a better interaction than learning that code tool that some other team happens to have chosen, right? Terraform or uh, Pulumi or you know Ansible or whatever. Um, but it's also actually enabling both teams to operate independently on their updates so long as they're meeting their contracts. It's a true API of there's a contract and you have to you know, uphold it. But other than that, keep going. And I think that sort of fleet management of resources under the hood for uh, users of an IDP without having to actually ask that person to pull requests, review something in their repo, or make, you know, open a ticket in their backlog to make that change is going to be something that's key because what users are demanding is the kind of uh, big cloud provider experience where I have an API and they tell me they take care of 80% of the problems. Here's the 20% I have to worry about and I'll manage it. And we have our contract. And that's what they're demanding now from their internal tools as well. So mm -hmm. having IDPs, whether that be platforms or portals, provide that abstraction layer and manage those life cycles independently and as as fleets as well as individuals i think is going to be a key uh, success criteria for the future as well yeah no i agree love it love it how to summarize that uh yeah anything else before we finish today yeah i would just say one more thing maybe yeah. just one uh, uh, so one of the advantage of using the developer hub uh, for example when you want to uh, to add plugins or extend the platform you don't have to necessarily go and uh, and play with the code of, of the portal uh, and, and rebuild and, and manage all the entire deployments uh, in, uh, in your organization. Uh, you, we have a, a mechanism of dynamic plugins, so you can just add uh, extra features to the to, to the portal, and so that, that also accelerate uh, uh, to add extra extra features. Yeah, I love the dynamic plugins. It makes it so easier just to integrate with because we need all those toolings, right? Like the CICD, connecting with the cluster, visualization. I, I, yeah, it's so much easier right now. And so thank you. Thank you for the work. Thank you for including that in the product. Love it. Um, okay, anything else? Okay, with that, well, thank you. You've been fantastic. Uh, thank you for, for joining us today. I have an amazing, amazing discussion, and I hope everyone who is watching uh, enjoyed this session as well. Please stay connected, and we will we'll talk to you soon. And I will stop the recording. Uh, thank you on? for having us. Of course.